I thought what would be interesting today is to um, go back a little bit and, and look at where this, my whole adventure in ABO in immunobiology started, just a little bit, and then try and share with you some of the questions that have arisen over the years and some of, some of um, the new collaborations that we've entered into with a particular group at the University of Alberta that um, are helping us generate new avenues of exploration to continue to look at questions related to ABO immunobiology in the setting of organ transplantation. So Laurie, when I first learned about transplantation, ABO compatibility was a golden rule. You seem to be rewriting those rules. Would that be a fair comment? Uh, I would say, first of all, with regards to the rules uh, requiring ABO compatibility in organ transplantation, I think it would be prudent for everyone to go back and examine exactly what led to those rules being formulated and upon what basis, what clinical experience or what theoretical concerns were those rules put in place. And, and if you do that, you come to find out that those rules were very sensible uh, initially, but they were based entirely on um, kidney transplants performed in adult patients. And the magnitude of the ABO barrier uh, became appreciated very quickly, of course and one wouldn't want to lose a patient and a graft for that reason. But the stringency with which those became embedded in concrete <laughs> or carved in stone uh, really is, uh, is probably unwarranted if you go back really and look at it. When heart transplantation was undertaken, as you know, in the late 60s, um, those rules were just adopted from kidney transplant rules, weren't they? And then when heart transplantation eventually uh, was um, undertaken in younger and younger children and, when, and particularly when Len Bailey started doing heart transplants in infants, the rules were never re-examined mm. uh, given the, particular, the, particular, the particularities of the infant immune system. And it's not just ABO compatibility, none of the rules for transplantation were really examined in a mm. developmental perspective. Well that's, that's of course true Laurie, but uh, when one looks at the history of those heart transplantations that were carried out where there was ABO incompatibility, um, the, the result was catastrophic. To go back to the first part of your question, when ABO, the, the reported cases in the literature of ABO incompatible transplantation, I think we need to look at those in a little more detail, even just thinking about them. Why were they so universally catastrophic when ABO incompatible kidney transplantation wasn't necessarily catastrophic? I think the reason is, if you look closely, every heart transplant that's done requires administration of blood products. If it was an unanticipated ABO incompatibility, mm -hmm. unappreciated, mm -hmm. then the, the blood products used to prime the pump, to take care of the machinery, mm -hmm. and to administer to the patient would have made it a hundred times worse yes. than if you had planned that. Uh, so taken unawares in a blood group O recipient, you're giving blood group O blood products containing antibodies that are detrimental to the graft, so you're making it worse as you're doing the procedure. In an A to O patient transplanted at six months of age, sampled at 14 months of age, you can see an absence of both. And this is probably the most interesting. This was the first child to receive an ABO incompatible transplant in Toronto. This was an AB to O uh, performed in, uh, on Valentine's Day 1996. And this was sampled 15 years later in our lab. And as you can see, there is no detectable anti-A or anti-B antibody when the proper controls are set up and we can reproduce this um, day to day, month to month, um, and presumably center to center. When, when I was first working in Toronto, our, our uh, mortality rate for infants on the waiting list was greater than 50%. So although there was this promise of a hopeful therapy, in practical terms, no one was able to get donor organs. And I do remember turning down a donor organ, a really, you know, a, um, a, by, all, by all indicators, it would have been a successful transplant, but I was obliged to turn it down because it was uh, an ABO incompatible donor. And, and I kind of, it caused me to go back and really re-examine the rules and think about not only the, the, the needs of the patient population, but the specifics about their immune system. Mm -hmm. And as you know, babies just don't have the mediators, the, 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 the parts of the immune system that are so devastatingly destructive in the setting of adults. So once you begin to realize that, it's, it's actually, the parents that I first spoke to about it uh, were 
cautious, and rightly so. It was the first one that had ever been a attempted. But it's so sensible, it's so logical. And the things that we knew about infant antibody development had been known for a long time. So it wasn't new, it was just putting it together, old knowledge in a new way. And that makes it a little bit easier, I think, to help parents understand that yes, first of all, let's re-examine the rules, <laughs> why they came to be, and what the real situation is. One of the things I've, I've uh, I kind of noticed about uh, the, the, our understanding of human biology is that uh, the more careful view on things now suggests that things are much more complex than we perhaps originally thought. I think that's right. We tend to think of, um, certainly when I learned about the ABO blood groups mm. way back in medical school, it was fairly straightforward. There are these three blood groups, they look like this. Uh, there's, that's all there is to it. And what's surprising to me as a scientist is that this field has gone unexplored for I mean, unexplored in depth with new tools and new understandings for, for really quite a long time. Uh, and yet we base our clinical decisions on this imperfect, far from perfect science with, without a lot of curiosity as to really what the details might be. Um, so it's certainly as we're discovering, as we, we delve further into this with the tools that are afforded to us by our, our collaborations with chemists, with, with really the hard science, the hard scientists, um, things are opening up in ways that really we should have understood were never going to be quite that simple. And there were always things that were inexplicable about ABO biology. Is it really sensible that it's this magic appearance of antibodies, for example? So, Laurie, the final question has to be, where do you see this uh, work uh, um, leading to in five years' time? Well, I think down the road in the not too distant future, we will certainly have a better understanding, a more precise understanding of, uh, of ABO biology. We will understand the antigens better, the structures themselves better, and the immune response to them. Um, I think that when we can develop these tools in such a way that they're far more predictable than they are now, we will likely be able to open doorways and offer combinations of donors and recipients that, that we're uh, perhaps more cautious about now. And we'll be undertaking intentional incompa uh, incompatible transplants in a way that we're much more certain about. And so we can choose, um, it, we can advise a family if there's a, a very high risk status but a patient is at high risk of dying, we can say really uh, this, we know enough about this now. We can predict this better now so that we understand the priorities better and the risks and benefits will be clearer. So I think in five years' time, probably it will be much more matter of fact. I think we'll be able to have a profile um, of easy diagnosis of some of the things we talked about today uh, that will allow the clinician to make those decisions much more easily. Thank you very much.